My creepy neighbor pointed his telescope directly at my bedroom, and the police refused to take it seriously, so I took matters into my own hands. A few months ago, a man moved in across the street from me, and on his very first day, I noticed he had set up a telescope outside his window and aimed it directly at my bedroom. My first encounter with him came a few days later. He knocked on my door to introduce himself, and one of the first things he told me was, I was worth going to jail for. My blood ran cold, and the entire interaction was unpleasant. I closed the door on him, but he persisted until I opened it again, warning him not to come inside. He stared at me blankly, then walked away with a smile and without a word. I went back inside immediately after and ran up to my bedroom and was not at all surprised to see that his telescope was still pointed at my bedroom. I remember taking a super long shower to hopefully clear my mind, but I could not settle it. Every sound I heard reminded me of him, and so the next day, I went to the police. I thought surely they would listen to me and explain the situation and how concerned I was. Unfortunately, I was reminded that as a woman sometimes you are not taken seriously, even in situations like these, as the officers listened but seemed uninterested in what I had to say. One asked me if I was sure that I wasn't imagining things, and the other said it's not illegal to own a telescope and to come back when I have actual proof. Apparently him coming over and making such a remark was not enough either, as that was clearly just a distasteful joke in the eyes of the officers. I remember coming home defeated, and a few days later, just as I thought it would, things got worse. One evening as I was getting ready for bed, I noticed something through the window. His shadowy figure was hunched over the telescope as usual, but his movements were different, more frantic. I realized that he was rubbing one out while watching me, and again when he noticed that I was looking at him, he didn't stop. He started moving his hand faster as if me watching him was exactly what he wanted, and just before I could leave the window, the movement stopped, and he took his hand out. I saw some Something dripped from his hand and felt sick to my stomach. I actually went into the bathroom and got sick. I stayed awake all night that night, realizing that this truly was a nightmare, and that this man was a psychopath who would terrorize me to no end if someone didn't stop him. I stayed awake until the stations opened, and as soon as they did, I went back to the police. I told them what I had seen, explained that my eye bags were because I had not slept because of what I had seen, and desperately hoped they would understand the severity of the situation. As I, have, I said that I was scared that he'd eventually find his way into my home somehow. I even told them about my ex and how he was a stalker. I went into detail about how after our relationship he kept visiting me at my job kept running into me, leaving notes for me at my door. I said this all in an attempt to get them to understand. However, once again, I was reminded what it's like to be a woman. They told me that if I was so worried about him, then I needed to move or get better curtains. Another officer said that they needed concrete evidence, and my word just wasn't enough. It was clear that I wouldn't get any help from them unless it was too late. I knew I had to do something myself if I wanted this stranger to leave me alone. Weeks passed, and the stranger from the window tried to get closer and closer to me. I knew the second the gifts started appearing on my doorstep that this had gone too far. They were small things at first. Flowers, chocolates, a book I had once mentioned in a conversation at the local cafe when I was grabbing coffee with my best friend. Then, he started coming over and presenting these gifts to me in person. He would ask to hang out often, but I always told him I was busy. Things were getting extremely out of hand, and one evening he excitedly knocked on my door, holding a small box. He handed me the box to open. He seemed proud of himself. I found them together. They were in love, so I had to keep them together. Forever. In the box were two frogs that he unalived himself and kept in a shoebox decorated in white. He called them Chris and Curtis. My stomach churned, and I forced a smile. I felt my insides boiling, however, and the taste of sick started creeping up on me. I have to go, I said, closing the door before running to the bathroom to get sick. He was a psychopath, a monster. Throughout this whole time, the telescope stayed there too, and I caught him looking at it on way more than one occasion. When he showed up at my door one evening with a stuffed animal and a creepy smile yet again, I knew I had to take matters into my own hands. If the justice system wasn't going to help me, I would have to help myself. It took a lot of courage for me to do this, but the best thing I ever thought of was to play along. I had deducted that if I would going to be friends with him, he wouldn't hurt me. He was way too infatuated with me to ever do that, even if I was just friends with him. And so that's what I did. I kept him at a distance but pretended to befriend him. I invited him over for coffee. I knew that my brother would be in town that weekend and had his number on speed dial. When he walked in, he tried to hug me, but I shook his hand and led him to the kitchen counter. We talked while we drank coffee. He told me that I had the most beautiful bedroom and that I looked even better so close up. We only sat in the living room when he came over, so I knew then that he was referring to the times he'd watch me through the telescope. I felt a shiver run down my spine and forced a polite, thank you. It was getting late, and I told my brother to call me at exactly 6 p.m. to have an excuse to kick the stalker guy out of my house. It was 10 minutes before 6 when I realized I didn't know his name. He told me it was Joseph, and before I could give him a fake name, he said, I enjoyed my time here with you, Mia, and tried again to hug me. I shook his hand once again and sent him off. Hearing him say my name was sickening, I felt violated. This nightmare was becoming a lot to handle, and after that encounter with him, I kept thinking if this was really such a good idea. However, I was still determined to stand for myself, and so I kept going along with it. The next week, he invited me to his apartment to watch a movie. He asked if I had watched Silence of the Lambs before, and I told him no, and we agreed to watch it. The movie choice felt odd as a first pick, but I went with it. I noticed multiple times throughout the movie he would look at me, hoping that I'd look back but I recognized that look. It was the dead fish stare that men give you before they tried to kiss you. I never returned the glance. Each time he invited me over, we'd watch a movie and order food, but over time I noticed something. He never let me into his room. He always kept that door firmly shut. I knew there had to be something in there that he didn't want me to see, because one night after, we watched a movie. I told him that I was going to use the restroom before I went back to my apartment, and as I got up to head to his bedroom, he grabbed my arm tightly and twisted it. I jumped. I turned around, terrified of what he might do next. He realized he was hurting me and let go. He smiled and told me that his toilet wasn't flushing properly at the 
at the moment and that maintenance would be in to fix it soon. I told him no worries and got out of that apartment as fast as I could. I normally keep boundaries around him, but this time I had let it get too out of my control. But I knew that room held the evidence I needed to prove his obsession with me. It sickened me to think about what I might find in there, but I knew it was my only chance to put an end to this. One afternoon I went to his house with a plan. I had brought a bottle of wine to drink while we watched another movie. We sat down, and I poured us each a glass of wine. Joseph immediately scooted closer, his thigh pressing against mine. He talked animatedly. I nodded and acted engaged in the conversation. As the movie played, Joseph's hand found its way to my knee and squeezed it. I stiffened, but he didn't seem to notice. Instead, he leaned in closer. His breath was hot against my ear and mentioned how alcohol made him feel more intimate. I forced a laugh. He whispered about how beautiful he found me and how long he had been waiting for that night. I excused myself for a moment and told him that I was fetching more wine. I was nervous as I discreetly slipped something into his glass. Returning to the living room, I handed him the drink. My heart was pounding in my chest. Joseph took a long sip, his eyes never leaving mine. Gradually, his speech slurred and I saw his eyelids starting to droop. He mumbled something about needing to lie down, struggling to keep his eyes open. Even while he was fading away, Joseph wanted me badly. He leaned in and attempted to undress me. His movements were clumsy and desperate. Just as his intentions became clear, his eyes rolled back and he slumped forward, his head resting heavily on my shoulder. I gently eased him onto the couch, watching as he fell into a deep sleep. My heart raced as I stood there for a moment, gathering my thoughts and the courage to proceed. Taking a deep breath, I made my way to his bedroom door. It was always firmly shut whenever I visited, but now with him unconscious, I knew this was my chance. I struggled to open the door at first. I noticed it was an odd-shaped keyhole and that it was locked. I panicked, looking for a key. I checked the kitchen drawers and the living room, and that's when I knew I had to check him. I reached for his pocket, afraid he might wake up. I couldn't find the key. I only found his wallet, a vape, and a pack of gum. I thought that maybe this was all for nothing until I opened the wallet and found the key stashed between his money. I felt overcome with relief and took the key to the bedroom. I hesitated for just a second before pushing the door open. The sight that greeted me was worse than I had imagined. The walls were covered in photos of me, some taken through the telescope, others obviously snapped without my knowledge. I saw photos of me in restaurants with my friends, and even some from inside of my apartment. There were drawings, notes, and even some of my missing personal items. He had built an entire shrine of me, and it made my skin crawl. I took photos of everything, documenting the disturbing collection. I went through his things, and I knew this was the evidence I needed. I slipped out of his house, leaving him to sleep. The next morning, I went straight to the police with the photo evidence. They finally took me seriously. The photos were undeniable proof of his stalking and obsession. The one who told me that it wasn't illegal to own a telescope said, we failed you, and for that, I'm truly sorry. Your bravery in gathering this evidence has made a huge difference. Detectives examined the evidence and prepared to arrest Joseph. Turns out he had charges pressed against him by his ex-girlfriend for stalking her after their relationship. He was arrested later that day, and I breathed a sigh of relief. When they asked how I had gotten into his house, I explained our so-called friendship. I told them how he would come over to my house with gifts and how I would spend time with him so I could gain his trust. I even told them about Chris and Curtis. The officers were shocked but understood why I had to do it. As they led Joseph out of his apartment in handcuffs, I stood across the street, watching. He glanced over at me. He looked hurt and betrayed, but I felt nothing but relief. Update. I walked away from this whole situation with a lot of psychological scars and a deep fear of people. It has been over a year since it all went down, and although I am happy to say that I have dealt with the situation, I'm not happy to inform that the mark he left on me was so severe I now struggle with dating. I was so scared of my old house and that street that I spontaneously quit my job and moved out, living in my car for about a month until I was able to find a new home a few states away. I also found a job in a field that I like, so that's something I guess, but in general life is pretty bleak right now. There are still nights where I dream of him, and every time someone rings my doorbell I still have the fear of it being him. However, I do know that is not the case, as he was sentenced to seven years in a state prison, followed by a mandatory psychological treatment. At least I can take solace in that.